Uh, what a great afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. This has really been a blessing. Uh, thank you so much, Randy. Thank you very much for being here with us. I hope you'll come back. Uh, this this uh, can't be uh, the only opportunity that we have to hear from you. So we love to have you come back and be with us. So thank you very, very much for that. And uh, your brother, uh, Bruce Robert, uh, I want to say thank you to both of you for being here with us. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of information. I'm Bill Lovell, senior pastor here at Metro Crest. I've only been here about a year, uh, but I love this church, and uh, the church has been through some tough times, but God has been very, very gracious, and honestly, one of the things he's done here at Metro Crest that most delights me is this uh, powerful revitalization of our deacons. Our deacons ministry has just taken off, and God is blessing it, and I'm so grateful to our deacons for all that they are doing. Uh, I'm very grateful to Brian Franklin and our partners over at New St. Peter's. Uh, it has been a delight to work with them and to cooperate with them. Uh, as Dalton and Brian put this together, I've been able to sort of be a little bit of a cheerleader and encourage them, uh, which has been very easy to do. I'm, I'm grateful for their partnership. Uh, I do want to extend a very warm welcome to you. Uh, Dalton expressed this earlier. I'd just like to say it again on behalf of the session and all the people of Metro Crest. We're honored that this inaugural uh, Deacons and Mercy Ministries conference uh, has been here at Metro Crest. That's a joy to us. And on behalf of the whole church, we want to extend our warmest welcome and our sincerest best wishes. Uh, We'd love to see the deacon's ministry in our presbytery blossom. Uh, we think that there's great potential, and I see it today among uh, you all, and it's a, it's a great privilege to see that. We're happy to be a part of it here at Metro Crest. Uh, just before we get started, I wanted to give you a, a few statistics which may be encouraging to you. It's certainly been encouraging to me. These aren't complete because I think there are a few names we haven't caught. But I just wanted to let you know that there are 14 PCA churches represented here today. Uh, 14 PCA churches from our presbytery. Uh, Christ Church Katy, would you wave a hand if you're from Christ Church Katy? Uh, Christ Community Frisco. Got a big crowd back there. Christ the King DeSoto. Uh, Woodson, I'm not sure maybe they left early. Uh, Collinville Press. In the room. Uh, Denton Press. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Fort Worth Press. Yeah, crowd from Fort Worth. Uh, Grace Community Fort Worth. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Mercy Dallas. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Metro Press Carols. I know a bunch of you guys are in the room. Thank you very much. Uh, New City Fellowship Dallas. Yeah, thank you. Uh, New Covenant Dallas. <laughs> Got two hats on. I, I answered wrong. <laughs> New St. Peter's Dallas. Look at this crowd. What a, we're so indebted to the deacon's ministry at New St. Peter's. We appreciate so much our partnership with you all. Thank you. Uh, Redeemer Arlington. There we go. And uh, Redeemer McKinney. They left early, I guess. Town North Richardson. There we go. Uh, and Zion Prosper. Great, great, great. Uh, 14 or so were registered, and some may have left early, but uh, that's a great turnout, and we, I think, just made it past 60. We were praying for 50, which we thought was kind of an optimistic number, uh, but uh, based on what we have out at the sign-up desk, we believe 60 people attended one or more sessions here this weekend. That's, that's a great beginning. We hope it won't be the ending. We'd like to see the deacons of our presbytery get together, run with some of the ideas we're talking about this weekend, sort of implement some of the things that we've been talking about. Uh, one of the thoughts I had was, wouldn't it be a great idea if the deacons from North Texas Presbytery got together at the next presbytery meeting? Uh, come to the worship, 7 o'clock on Friday night, uh, and then maybe have some fellowship, maybe talk about some next steps, what you'd like to do. Uh, how you'd like to get together going forward. I thought, well, that's something that would require the cooperation of the host church for the next Presbytery meeting. Well, guess who that is? <laughs> Present, uh, we're hosting the Presbytery meeting here at Metrocrest. It's our first time in several years we're hosting it. I'd love to make this 
uh, the diaconal presbytery meeting. I'd love to have all 60 of you come back, worship the Lord with us. We can set up all the extra chairs we need, have a time of worship, have a time of fellowship, have elders and deacons in the room at the same time and work together on some of the things we've been talking about. And I do want to acknowledge that there are a number of teaching elders in the room. Uh, we're grateful to all of our brother elders uh, for taking the time and trouble to be here. We're very grateful to our presbytery, which has been extremely supportive. So please think about coming to the next presbytery meeting. It's in early May, uh, I think the first weekend of May, as here at Metrocrest. And we would be honored and thrilled to have you with us. Thank you very much for sharing this Saturday. All right. Well, if you would, my brothers and sisters, would you please stand as we open this service with a responsive call to worship uh, from Psalm chapter 40, verses 16 through 17. And those can be found on the first page of your bulletin. The Lord is high above all nations. And his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high? Who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust, and lifts the needy from the ash heap, to make them sit with princes, with the with princes, princes of his people. people. He gives the barren woman a home, making, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord indeed. Would you please sing with us?
you see there in the bulletin a passage from Psalm 68 that I'd like to read it uh, for us right now. I'd love for you to follow along. Starting in verse 4. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord. Exult before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God and his holy habitation. Mm -hmm. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. O oh God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens poured down rain before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. Rain in abundance, O oh God, you shed abroad. You restored your inheritance as it languished. Your flock found a dwelling in it. In your goodness, O oh God, you provided for the needy. Mm. Let's continue to sing.
come together today, um, let us continue as brothers and sisters in Christ to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'd like to do, uh, love to do a responsive reading, and actually from the BCO chapter 9, which for all of you should mean something. You should have read that one once before. <laughs> but it's always a good reminder to, to know what... Uh, uh, the PCA has to say about the office of deacon. So let's uh, go through this together. What is the office of deacon? The office of deacon is set forth in the scriptures as ordinary and perpetual in the church. The office is one of specific deacons in service after the example of the Lord Jesus. It expresses also the communion of saints, especially in the What is the duty of the deacons? It is the duty of the deacons to minister to those who are in need, to the sick, to the friendless, and to anyone who may be in distress. It is their duty also to develop the grace of liberality in the members of the church, and to devise effective methods of collecting gifts of the people, and to distribute these gifts among the objects to which they are. They shall have the care of the property of the congregation, both real and personal, and shall keep in proper repair the church edifice and other buildings belonging to the congregation. What sort of men ought deacons to be? The office of deacon, which is spiritual in nature, shall be chosen men of spiritual character, honest repute, exemplary lives, brotherly spirit, warm sympathies, and sound judgment.
today from all over DFW and beyond. Father, we thank you for a group of people so willing to spend time trying to learn ways in which we can better serve your people. Father, we thank you for the fruit that you have already begun to grow in us thus far from what we've looked at today. Father, we continue to ask that you would uh, be with each of us, that you would continue to open our hearts to hear uh, from you this afternoon. Father, we pray that you would be with Randy as he, as he comes to speak to us. Father, bless his words uh, and let them just be glorifying to you. Father, we love you so much. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good to see you. Ready? Well, I'm so glad so many of you have survived this <laughs> one. Thank you for giving up your Saturday afternoon uh, for this. Before we get into the Word, uh, let me just make a few comments. One is thank you for putting on this uh, conference, this, it's really encouraging to my heart, as I, I guess you would say that I am the official denominational mercy guy, and uh, I, I'm quick to claim that I am a victim of mercy, and uh, I, none of us would be in the faith without the mercy of God, amen? Amen. So, we, you know, we are just, everything we have to give only came because God gave it to us. And we are grateful for that. Um, my wife and I, uh, we ask your prayers. Joan and I will be leaving for London uh, on April 7th, and we'll be there for about five months uh, working for New City, London, in a neighborhood called Shepherd's Bush, which is a church plant that started uh, with Surge, or formerly World Harvest Mission. And uh, they asked us to come two years ago we had our tickets, we had our visas, everything was set, and then COVID shut us down. And so they have some young pastors there that need mentoring. It's a very multi-ethnic neighborhood. And so we just ask for your prayers. And so I will be taking a leave from m &A for that time, but then uh, in the fall we'll be back uh, doing this ministry, Lord willing. Um, and it's been a wonderful 10 years, really, of doing this work since I stepped down from my pulpit. We've encountered so many wonderful churches. And I just want to give you encouragement. The PCA has had a lot, of, a lot of conflict over the last year or two. But I do want you to know on the grassroots level, God is at work. People are being saved. Ministries going on. Churches are being planted. Hearts are being revived. There's always mess. Because every church that we've ever been to is full of sinners. <laughs> if we could just stop that, <laughs> things would roll along really well. But every single church and every single person in it is a sinner. Saved by grace they belong to Jesus, but yet we struggle against sin. So please don't be discouraged. Be encouraged. God is at work. And I'm glad to be here today to see God is at work in you. Now, one, I have a request that when we're done, when we have the closing benediction, if we could, could we all come up here to the front so I can get a picture of y'all? Would that be okay? A group picture. Our photographer that we have has suggested we go to the back and take it from the front Back. Whatever you want to do, that's cool with me. I, I just want to get a picture of you. All right. So if if you have uh, your Bible or your phone Bible, whatever you use, uh, we're going to go into the book of Acts, and we're going to start in chapter 4. And you might call the title of this sermon or talk, uh, God's Believing and Faithful People Give. God's believing and faithful people give. And so that's kind of how I will direct uh, my thoughts. And 
Uh, I will say this is not necessarily an expository sermon, uh, so there'll be a sort of a potpourri of things as I think of them that I'm just going to throw at you, and there's no extra charge for that. <laughs> Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. 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 Verse 32 of chapter 4 of the book of Acts. <clears throat> now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold the field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now we're going to skip to chapter 6, which comes right after chapter 5. <laughs> now in those days, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said, pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Amen. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Well, brothers and sisters, this is an amazing story of the beginning of the early church. And I used to preach from Acts chapter 6, and then I realized that it really should not be preached unless you tell people about Acts chapter 4. Because here's a question when you read chapter 6, which is uh, the famous passage, uh, especially as deacons, we have an interest in that. Where did the first deacons come from? Is this the origin of the diaconate? And here's another question that's often unasked and unanswered is, where did the money come from? How are they feeding these widows? Did you ever think about that? Where do they get the money to do this? Well, it comes from chapter 4. In chapter 4, you see what the Holy Ghost is doing. The Lord is bringing people to faith through the preaching and the ministry of the apostles. Uh, all, right from the very beginning, when, when they are uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues that they've never learned, these are known tongues that the Holy Spirit gives them, and they are preaching the great things of God. And, and Acts chapter 2 is very careful to articulate how many different cultural groups, how many different language groups, all of whom are basically Jews, proselytes, or converted Jews, or ethnic Jews, but they, they, come, they represent all of these different places in the world. So right from the very beginning, even before we get to the issue of the conversion of Gentiles, the book of Acts is trying to say, what the Lord Jesus gave to the disciples to do, you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, is coming true. People are coming to faith. 
They are believing in Jesus. This is what the church is about. We are to be proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Calling people to faith. Amen? Amen. We don't do it enough. All right? We, we let the Baptists do it, and we Presbyterians reform them <laughs> and organize them. No, no. We are all given this great commission, all given this call of God, all given the same Holy Spirit by which we are able to preach the gospel to the lost. And the Holy Spirit converts them. He opens their eyes to believe. He draws them to the Father. Hallelujah. And that's what's happening here in, in Acts. People are getting saved. And look what happens. It's, 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 it, this, is a, this is a consistent pattern of the work of the Holy Ghost in the people of God through the whole Bible. When the Lord is at work, the people give. Even in the, in the desert, in the wilderness, when Moses had let the people out of Egypt, and God told him, I want you to build the tabernacle. And you should tell the people, bring your contributions. Bring stuff that we can make this tabernacle. Bring gold and silver and precious stones. Bring materials by which we can make this huge tent. And it says that finally the workers that God had anointed with special skill, they told Moses, tell the people to stop. We got too much stuff. And any, any, any pastor would love that day. <laughs> Stop. The, the plates are full. We can't take any more. Glory. <laughs> <laughs> so we ain't, we ain't there yet. <laughs> well, this is what happens when God moves upon his people. Believing, faithful people of God, they respond. They respond in faith with great generosity. And here in chapter 4, you see, it sees that people are, are bringing their gifts and laying it at the feet of the apostles. And this is kind of an interesting moment in the life of the church. Because they don't have a building. They don't have a, this is not a building fund. They, they, don't, they don't have big organization. They just are living by faith, trusting God, and the people of God are responding, and the money is being given. Now, in a way, the whole office of deacon reflects the office of Levites, the very practical, useful office. And they, the Levites were involved in the, in the physical uh, work of the tabernacle and the temple. They were also security and, and warriors, even guards. And they were also musicians. Uh, and, and it happened, you know, it came down by family. Uh, you know, it's interesting, even in Nehemiah, where we have the proof that musicians should be paid. <laughs> where, you know, uh, Nehemiah says, where, where are the musicians? And they said, well, the Levites, they had to go home and tend their fields. He said, oh, no. The people of God are supposed to take care of the Levites so they can be here for worship. And so they, they were all involved in this. Then, by the time of Jesus, the Jewish people uh, also had synagogues. And in each synagogue, they usually had a treasurer. They had somebody who was taking the gifts of God's people and helping it on a smaller basis than the whole nation that the Levites had to take care of. Then Jesus comes, and, Peter, and one particular Levite, a guy named Barnabas, gets saved. And what does he do in his response to the joy of the gospel? He says, I got, I got a field, I'm going to sell it, I'm going to take the money, I'm going to give it to the apostles. And I'm wondering, you know, we don't have any minutes of, of the elders meeting of the apostles' meeting, when somebody said, what do we do with this money? <laughs> you know, and uh, Peter said, well, I don't need any money because whenever I got to pay my taxes, I just go find a fish. <laughs> <laughs> and I get a couple of coins, you know. No. Somebody in that meeting said, not only did people from around the world who had come to Jerusalem for Pentecost 
stay. But we've got widows. We've got people here from outside and inside. That all of these, who's going to take care of them? And some of them have believed in Jesus and their own families may not want anything to do with them anymore. We as the community of faith, we got to take care of these ladies. We got to provide. Okay, we got money, let's buy bread. It was totally a good intention. They wanted to do good. And, you know, uh, as they say, sometimes uh, you get punished for your good intentions. You, you know, you, you mean to do well and then you make a mistake. And, and here we come to chapter 6 and what has happened. You have a daily distribution of food. Every day. You can show up and get fed by the church of Jesus Christ. Isn't that pretty cool? You know, I have had people at times tell me that the church uh, doesn't take care of people. I've had non-Christians tell me what they think the church ought to do. You ever met a non-Christian who knows better than you what the church ought to do? You know? And, you know, I remember even at, when I was a teenager and I was in the church and I was growing and I, I would hear people mock the church of Jesus Christ. And, and I would say, that does not reflect the church I'm in. The church I'm in helps poor people. The church I'm, I'm in is cross-cultural. They, you know, they are not racist. The church I'm in is standing for justice. So uh, what are they talking about? And then as I got older, I realized that there were plenty of churches they could point to and say, this church is totally self-absorbed. They, they take care of themselves. they got a great building. they got great facilities. But it's like the people could be dying around them in their very neighborhood, and they wouldn't even notice. I said, that's not what the church of Jesus Christ should be like. We ought to care about the people, because that's who Jesus is. That's what he does. And so I began to think about what the scriptures taught about how we care for the poor. And here it is. This church, the early church, is feeding widows. So I, as a pastor, I used to say this to my congregation. And I think it should be in the mind of every PCA member. There is never a day when anybody in any one of our churches should ever go hungry. You should know that. If you're part of this church and of this denomination. Know this, our commitment to you as a brother and sister in Christ. There is never a day if you are part of this community when your family should go hungry. Our children ought to know that as part of our reputation. It ought to be part of their identity. That's who we are. We are not selfish and self-absorbed and don't care. I think for just that one idea would transform a lot of people's view of what the church is. Now we had a lot of faults, but don't let it ever be said we can't share food with people. And here the early church is doing that. They had every intention that this was a good thing. And then you notice where the Hellenists were raising hell. <laughs> In case you missed the word Hellenist does not mean hellraiser. Okay. <laughs> Hellenist is Greek, all right? The Greek speaking widows started to complain. Why? Because in the distribution of food, the Jewish speaking believers were paying attention to people whose language they easily understood and whose culture they easily adjusted to. And so they were feeding the, the Hebrew-speaking widows and the Greek-speaking widows, these women who maybe had come from all parts of the world, they were being neglected. They were just being looked over. And they were hungry. And they're part of the church, and they sparked to speak out. And what did they do? They said, see, the same sin that happened in the people of Israel with Moses. You better watch out. Fire will come down from heaven and consume you. Or the earth will open up and consume you. Because you're complaining. You're murmuring. Now this is the point at which good Presbyterians should speak up and say, No! 
That is not the scripture. You're not used to doing that, but you should be careful. Because I just told you a lie. That is not what happened. The leaders of the church listened. And I would submit to you that that is, if you're going to write, if there are any points in the sermon, that would be a good one. You should write that down. The leaders of God's church listened to the people. They heard a legitimate complaint. Now look, I was a pastor for a long time, and I've received tons of criticism. Uh, I will tell you as a pastor, if you, if you don't like criticism, you're in the wrong job. Okay? Now, not, now let me rephrase that. I never liked criticism. But if you can survive it, and because we're going to make mistakes. There's going to be somebody in the hospital I didn't get to visit. There's, there's going to be somebody's uh, anniversary or happy birthday or celebration that I looked over and forgot I didn't get to. There's going to be something I'll say in my sermon that's stupid and somebody's going to get in, insulted. Okay, We are going to receive criticism. And if we're going to stay united in Christ, you're going to have to learn to listen to people. And those of you who are elders or deacons, there's always going to be somebody who knows your job better than you. There's always going to be somebody quickly to point out the deficit. That's not necessarily a bad thing. If we are humble before the Lord, we can hear it. And the cool thing about these apostles is they were humble before the Lord. Now, these guys were busy. They were busy preaching the gospel, and they were busy going to jail. <laughs> if you read the first five chapters, you realize that there were a lot of good reasons why apostles couldn't serve tables, because half the time, they were in jail. Or maybe they were at home recovering from getting whipped. They were faithful, serving God, and they were trying to get rid of this money that Christians kept dumping on them by buying food. Who's buying the groceries? Who's organizing? Who's cleaning up? There are a lot of things that we're missing here in the scripture. <laughs> Who did this? So they're, they're feeding these people and the, and the Greek-speaking widows are upset because they're being neglected. And the, and the apostles... The Holy Spirit really helps them think through this. And they go, we're doing a good thing. But maybe it's not for us to do it. Maybe our calling ought to be in prayer and the Word. So we need other people to do it. Just like Moses needed help. And, and his father-in-law said, it's too much for you. You need, you need other people to back you up and make judgments. And so they said, all right. We're going to, we want you to pick seven men good, who have a good reputation because you're going to be dealing with money. <clears throat> and money is dangerous for a lot of people. You know, the, the, money is the root of all kinds of evil, the scriptures teach us, and it's certainly true. I just, one of our churches, a really a struggling church economically, they just found out one of their deacons had stole $90,000 over the last couple of years, and he was playing the horses with that money. And they were wondering, why can't we ever make any progress? And they found out one of their own was stealing. And now he's been turned over to the district attorney. But, so obviously, deacons have to, if you're gonna handle money, don't trust yourself. You know, what we're Presbyterians, we don't trust anybody. So, <laughs> Always have checks and balances for what you do. But money, we can't function without money. God has given us resources to use, but we've got to realize it's te great temptation. God's people are generous when they believe and they give. And so here the apostles are saying, let's pick out seven men. Notice what they did. They, they said they've got to be of good reputation. They've got to have a wisdom. And they got to be full of the Holy Ghost. So if you notice in 1 Timothy 3 where it talks about elders and deacons, and one of the things I used to tell my people, man, men or women, 
Every one of you should aspire to have these qualifications. These are not special uh, for just super saints. These are the qualifications you ought to encourage every single saint in your church to have. We, we get these kind of guys. If we can find seven of them. Notice what they did. They, the names are all Greek. In other words, they said, we, we've got a cultural issue here. These women are not going to trust us. So how do, we, how do we build trust? Let's pick seven guys who have Greek names and they're culturally adaptable to this situation. By the way, this is the New Testament concept of cross-cultural ministry. That in order to win people, we must become like them. We must be their slave. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So if you ever deal cross-culturally, the, the secret is simple. You die to yourself, you become a slave to somebody else's culture, and you win them to Christ. It's real simple. It's just real hard. Okay? You, if without God's grace, you can't do it. So here, these men are chosen, and they pleased the whole group, and they said, that's right. That's right. This is exactly what ought to happen. And so God, in his mercy, allowed them to have people who could take charge of a very, very practical ministry. Now, people argue, are these the first deacons? I'm not sure if, these, if this is really the beginning of the office of deacon. Well, it sure uses the word minister a lot in the Greek. That's diakonia, and that's where we get deacon from. And it is a servant. It is a ministry of service. And it's a very practical one. And maybe sometimes uh, you don't get a lot of applause for it. Because, you know, you, if, you might even resent it. How, hey, I wanted to be an apostle. <clears throat> well, you're called to be a servant. I, I, that's not high enough. Why? Jesus was a servant. You don't get any higher than Jesus goes lower. In the church of Jesus Christ. If, if, if you pursue this office, if you pursue ministry because you're after status, you're after fame, you're after applause, you are in the wrong calling. You are here because God calls you to it and God equips you to it. Now let me just say a couple of things again. This is in, I'll just throw this out to you. We need deacons with all kinds of gifts. All of them need to have all the fruit of the Spirit. But not every deacon has every gift of the Spirit. And they're different. Like one, obviously you're dealing with money. So you would realize that maybe one of the gifts we need in the diaconate is the gift of administration. We need somebody who knows how to count. Okay? Somebody who can keep track of the money. Now, not every deacon should have the gift of administration. It's not necessary. But somebody's got to have it. And that may be the... How about if you had a deacon who had the gift of administration, but he didn't have the gift of mercy? Could such a thing exist? My answer is yes. But I, I had one deacon in my church who was the treasurer. Had the gift of administration. Certified public account. I did not want him to visit the sick. Because they would just die. <laughs> they had no empathy, no sympathy. It was about, and the army used to say, beans and bullets. Okay? You count things. And you go, you know, we really need this brother. He, and he loved the Lord. He's a good, valuable brother, but he's valuable in the use of his gift. <coughs> And that's one of the things you learn as a diaconate. How do we distribute the work so the people with, who are gifted for that particular part of it can do it? Not every deacon is really great at working uh, in, in a relational point of view with the poor. But you've got to have some of those people. And so the gifts of discernment. Some deacons are suckers. 
Anybody walking up to them asking them for money, they're giving it out. And they don't ever ask hard questions. And we, Brian just gave us a great history and quoted from Chrysostom uh, to say, you know, we don't want to be meddlesome when we, when we help people. We, we don't want to ask them a hundred questions uh, just finally at the end of it and say, oh, you're not qualified. You know, and part of one of the problems with our welfare society is it came about, especially during Victorian times, where we had people that were uh, considered worthy poor and unworthy poor. I don't know if you've ever seen the play My Fair Lady, but Elijah Doolittle's father, who's an alcoholic, he comes to her benefactor, you know, her language tutor, and he's trying to get in on the money that he thinks his daughter's getting. And it's really a funny scene. And he said, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not worthy. You know, I just want some money. Well, in Jesus, when we meet people, we have to have this generous, responsive heart and build a relationship with them because that's the secret to discipleship is relationship. And as we build that relationship, we then add accountability to it. And with accountability, sometimes we have to say no. Because the money I'm giving, you're just getting high with it. You're buying drugs with it. You're buying out. How am I helping you? So we need people with discernment. We need people who have that Holy Spirit gift. We need leadership. We need deacons who are able to help the rest of the deacons function together as a team. And of course, we need the gifts of mercy, service, and helps. And I've had wonderful brothers in my church say, Pastor, don't put me in charge. Just tell me what to do. I love guys like that. Because I always got stuff for them to do. <laughs> so, be wise in how you develop your day. Train consistently. Recruit. Recruit teenagers. If you're going to go to visit somebody, take young people with you so they can see it happen. That's a, a powerful moment in their lives to see that. Protect each other. Try not to work just as mavericks, as one person. Work as teams. Build teams around Families and people that you're trying to help. So there's prayer power and there's wisdom that is exercised there. And be generous. You know, I'll just tell you frankly, our churches are too cheap. We don't give enough away. Now, I will say this, and this is something you should remember. There is always more money for mercy in a congregation than you think. And usually the people of God are just waiting for a reason to give it. If you beat them over the head with tithing as, as a legalistic obligation, they don't become a cheerful giver. But boy, when you challenge the people of God, these people are hurting. Their hearts usually rip open and pour out in generosity. So don't be discouraged. If, deacons, if you're running out of money, Come to the, don't wait, you know, like we, it's a tradition in Presbyterian Church that alms were given uh, at a communion Sunday. And the problem with the Reformed people was they got down to having only four communions a year. So they said, we're going to have a special deacon's offering whenever we have communion. And since it's only four times a year, we're only going to take four offerings. That's nonsense. There's too much poverty. Now, by the way, you guys are doing great. May God help you to share your resources. Uh, you, one diaconate may be really good at something, and another diaconate may be good at something else. Learn to co collaborate. And how you don't have to all reinvent the wheel. And so you know denominationally, we have several funds that your churches ought to know about and they ought to give to. One is the Thanksgiving offering, in which we uh, give away grants to churches that are especially working with the poor who want to raise up leaders and give them an internship. So here's something you put in the back of your head. 
Every one of your churches should put aside money to hire your own college students and your own young people and give them an internship in how to do ministry, especially mercy ministry. If you're thinking, what do we use this money for? Recruit young people into ministry and pay them to do it. Even the people who have come to you for help, you can employ them to do this kind of work. So that's the Thanksgiving offering. This last two years, uh, we have what we call the Ethnos Coalition of all the ministries in the PCA that come from different ethnic groups. They formed a coalition, and then they formed the COVID Relief Fund. And they asked churches to contribute to it, so especially those people who had no government help could be given assistance during this time. And they, they gave away a quarter million dollars, at least. We have several congregations in our, our country, PCA churches, who've given hundreds of thousands of dollars away during COVID to help people. Hallelujah. And then there's one other from RBI, uh, Retirement Benefits and Investments. And this is the Widows Fund that is given to the widows of PCA pastors. And if any PCA pastor dies, they immediately send her a check for $1,000 as soon as they hear. And then they sit down with her to see if she has enough retirement income, enough support. And so we have widows in our denomination who are being given supplemental help every month from our denomination. That, that offering is taken around Christmas every year. So those are just some funds you ought to know about. So I'm going to end my talk now, and I just want you to understand what my point is. The believing, faithful people of God give. It's what we do. It's who we are. It is said that one of the Roman emperors wrote about the early Christians, and his complaint was, these Christians help our poor more than we do. And I would just say, church, you need to get your reputation back. Because that's what turned the world upside down. Shall we stand and pray? Father God, thank you for our time together today. We love you. We adore you. Jesus, thank you for being the best gift we ever got. We pray, Lord, that our hearts would never stop being generous in response to your love to us. And we pray, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Have a closing song and then a benediction. And then a photo.
words from the Apostle Paul, who is speaking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and our coming resurrection. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen. 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 All right, before you leave, we're going to get everybody in the center section looking towards the front of the church, looking towards the towards table. And we're going to set up a camera here, take a picture. So everybody get in real tight. We want a tight picture. And we want to see all the faces. Everybody move in, please. Except with masks and six feet. All people in the back. All people in the back. Smaller people towards the back. Less taller people towards the back. You want to seat it or stand? Stand. You want to stand, Dave? Um, I'd like the first. I'd like the first row to be seated. And uh, let's see. And if we could do some shorter to taller. My 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 uh, tripod is not tall enough to get over your heads. I could try it back behind the pulpit. I don't think it's going to work. I think if we could switch places with people that are taller in the back and shorter in the front, that would help. <laughs> And uh, I asked it to start with the third row. So you guys right here on the second row are not going to all get in there. We're going to have, have, you're going to have to get closer in like you like each other and nobody's got COVID, okay? I'd like everybody on the end of the rows to raise your hand so I can make sure you're all in. If you're on the end of the row, raise your hand, please. Not Pentecostal. <laughs> we won't get a picture of that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>